everybody and welcome to the third session of Women Rock IT series for the US and Canada. We have one other event happening later in the academic year. Today's speakers, um, two amazing women, are going to show how they've embraced technology to lead the way in, in multiple industries. Being part of our live audience today entitles you to enrollment in five um, of our self-paced online courses and we think they're really compelling courses. They are called Introduction to the Internet of Things, Introduction to Cybersecurity, Linux Essentials, Entrepreneurship, and Programming Essentials in Python. And if you're in the IT world, you know how hot Python is today. Details about how to enroll will be posted today during the event. I'd like to welcome over 2,000 students joining us either from groups in their classroom, in their school, from home, uh, at a coffee shop, wherever they may be in the US and Canada, and also a similar welcome to our instructors, parents, education leaders, and some of our Cisco staffers. In the interest of time, we'll take any questions that you have today for our guest speakers after both presentations. So if you're joining us over social media, you can post your question in the chat box. I'll try to answer as many as we can, but we always seem to have more questions than we have time. Thanks again, and let's get started. And so now I'll introduce our first speaker. Please welcome Rihanna Lynn, founder and CEO of Journey Foods. Rihanna, over to you. Hi, folks. Um, I think we actually mu accidentally muted Rihanna, so we're working to get her unmuted so she can bring you her talk about what she's doing with Journey Foods. And we all know that food availability and the ability to track our food is really important, whether you live in an urban area or a rural area. So um, as soon as we can get Rihanna unmuted, we will listen to her talk. And perhaps if we can't get her unmuted, we would switch to Samantha first. That might be something that we could do. Okay, Samantha, could you start for us and we'll work to get Rihanna unmuted. Sure thing, thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Samantha. I work at Cisco Systems. I am currently a technical lead on the market access team. Um, it's in cybersecurity, and if you don't know what market access is, that's totally fine. We'll go about that in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, we're going to go through my career journey, talk about some challenges, talk about what I do now, and then talk about some lessons learned that I've kind of gathered along the way. So if we want to go uh, to the next slide, we can kind of talk about my career journey and my learning journey thus far. Um, so I didn't actually start out knowing that I wanted to really do anything in technology. Um, and I, I think it's mostly because I didn't have access to any technology classes. So I went to an all girls high school and it kind of stereotypically fell victim to a curriculum that had absolutely no tech courses, um, unless you count typing, in which case there was one. But other than that, no, uh, I wish that I had Cisco Netacad courses available to me. It would have probably made so much of a difference and kind of expedited my career path, but I didn't know it at the time when I was in high school. so. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I was heavily involved in my school's like business club, so absolutely nothing to do with tech at all. Um, and so I went into school thinking I was gonna do law, so I went to Pace University, which is in New York City, um, and I majored in accounting and pre-law. And I lasted about one semester, <laughs> and I took one tech course. It was just basic HTML web coding, and I was just captivated. I didn't know anything about what I could make with a computer. I didn't know anything about software development. I just assumed, you know, 
I just go on the internet and I maybe go on my MySpace page. I might be dating myself at the time, but that's all we had back then. Um, and so I took one HTML class and I absolutely fell in love with technology. And now it became a matter of what do I want to do in tech? And going through all of the, the myriad of possibilities, cybersecurity was one that really kind of ticked my interest. So I transferred from Pace because it was a, a, a notoriously liberal arts school. And I transferred to the Rochester Institute of Technology where I majored in information security and forensics. Um, and then I took advantage of my school's internship programs, and I, my first internship was actually with Cisco Systems. And I did an internship where I worked in a huge networking lab. But to kind of back up, when I transferred into RIT, I really cannot emphasize how little I knew about technology. I really just had a passion to learn. And I think a lot of people kind of assume you have to go into school kind of knowing what you want to do and knowing at least the basics. You really don't. You just have to have the passion and the, the willingness to learn because I certainly didn't know anything. And kind of going through, I went, I did my first internship with Cisco. Again, I applied for the job and I didn't know that much because it was more networking focused, but it was awesome. It was this huge lab I got to work in every day with every device Cisco has ever made. And I got to run connections, do like layers one through three kind of configuration. And I really got my kind of hands dirty with, with the actual manual side of technology. I then kind of shifted, again, taking advantage of my school's internship program, and I went to intern at Liberty Mutual. My thought process was I wanted to see what it was like working in a technology area from a non-tech company. So Cisco is a tech company, right? We're a solution-based technology company. Liberty Mutual is not. It's an insurance company. So I kind of wanted to see from a different perspective the different kind of work angles that working at a tech company versus not tech company would be and there are there are very big differences but you know my first love was always cisco so i came back when i graduated i gladly moved from upstate new york i never want to see snow again i moved to north carolina where i currently work and i started off in the technical assistance center which was honestly the best job best first job i could have ever had it really kind of gets your get your brain working, getting that troubleshooting mindset, really learning how to come at a problem, not just from a technical mindset, but maybe political, maybe something else. It really, really is a great first job to work at like level one, like layer one kind of technical support for really anything if you're looking into the tech industry, because it really gets you familiar with understanding the technology that you're trying to, to implement. Uh, and then I kind of moved a little bit uh, towards back towards security because I worked in data center technology and there are security components to data center, but I really wanted to just focus on cybersecurity. So I shifted and I moved into the security and trust org at Cisco. Um, and what I did first was I worked on the strategic country engagement team. And that was a great, great job. I got to travel all around the world and I got to talk to regulators, critical infrastructure customers. I got to implement and do workshops where I taught them about trustworthy technology. So code signing, image signing, uh, trust anchor modules, how to trust the hardware and the software of Cisco's products essentially. So that was a really fun job. And I recently within the last year and a half moved within the same org, but to the market access team. So taking those relationships that I had with those regulators, those critical infrastructure customers, those very strategically valuable customers, and I got to move into the market access space, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but I, and I wanna save that for a little bit later. So if we wanna kind of move to the next slide, I wanted to summarize kind of the challenges that I faced going through. Kind of so far, as you see, my journey is not exactly a straight line, but that's probably why they don't call it a career straight line, right? They call it a career journey. So the, the first kind of point that I, I wanted to make is was one that I didn't realize was a challenge until I was out of it, was being invited but not included. So when I was at RIT, I was the only woman in any of my classes. It was 2010 at the time. so. It was still a relatively new major, let alone kind of field. And so I remember on my first day, I looked around my class and I was like, oh, I'm the only girl here. That's weird. It must be an anomaly. But throughout the entire day, I was the only female in any of my classes. So that alone right there, I, I was like, OK, maybe there's a, a gender gap in the tech field. I had no idea because, again, I knew nothing about tech. So uh, being invited, not included, I was always in my classes. I would always, you know, hang out with my my co or my, my classmates. but I would never kind of get to hang out with them outside of class. I was always excluded from like lab-based coursework. I, I almost always did all my labs by myself, mostly because I didn't have a partner. But it was kind of sure, it, it kind of, when I started in work, at, working at Cisco, I realized that just having, you know, diversity is not diversity. You, you can be invited to the table, but until you're included, you're not a real diverse 
kind of place. And Cisco kind of showed me that it's not just having, you know, women at the table, it's inviting them to participate and to, you know, contribute back what, what their unique perspective and, and differences are. And so the second kind of point was more so in, in college heavily, I always felt like I had to double my preparedness, be overly knowledgeable in order to be considered equal. And it was almost like I was starting at a negative, like I was starting two steps back and I could never understand why, but I, I think it maybe had to do with the perception of just being different and not being like the normal kind of hacker because I was in a security field. So you, you think, right, the pasty guys in the basement with their hoods up, like that's not me. So I kind of felt like I started a little bit of a disadvantage, but I, I tried to you know, keep myself <laughs> up. But kind of that leads to the third point, the self-doubt and like the imposter syndrome. You have to kind of change your self-talk. You know, like I deserve to be here. I want to be here. I love what I'm doing and I'm going to keep moving. But it's, it's really hard, especially when you're younger, to understand that and to think just because someone you know, thinks one way, that doesn't mean that that's how I should see myself. And so that's kind of an ongoing thing that still kind of resonates true. But the fourth point, kind of being taken seriously, it was interesting because I never realized the programming that I got as a younger girl, you know, always smile, always be nice, hey, don't be too aggressive, don't be blunt, you know, you don't want to come off as bossy, but that is not how that works in the tech world. And so I kind of had to reprogram myself to speak with more confidence, not say things and then like giggle and laugh afterward, just treat myself like the technical expert that I was. And at first it was very uncomfortable. I thought I sounded mean, I was too aggressive, but it's really not the case. It was just interesting because I didn't realize how my personality and my behavior was shaped just simply because of gender roles. And so kind of navigating the heavily male dominated workplace that is the tech industry, Cisco does a great job of kind of accommodating that, but I know a lot of, of people that work in other areas and it's just, it's a boys club and you're either invited or you're not, and if you're not, tough luck. And so that's, that's really hard to navigate, especially because of the, the last point, the lack of women in leadership roles, because it, it's nice to see someone like you in a role that's higher up so that you can kind of see yourself maybe achieving that one day. So I have, I have a personal goal myself of being a CISO, and it's really nice to see women in those roles because then I can kind of model myself after them, I can look up to them, I can see what they lessons learned, but there's really not that many that are heavily technical in this field. And so I find that to be a challenge for me just because I'd like to see more, but if you wanna move, uh, keep going, we'll talk about kind of what I do now. Um, and I, I work uh, in market access, and if we wanna keep going, essentially what that is, is it is requirements, certifications, attestations, really any, any legal kind of requirement for a market. And when I say market, I mean a government or a country or a, a sales like industry, so like healthcare, or finance, or anything like that. So understanding and influencing those global requirements is a huge part of my job. So I kind of see myself in the middle of like a tug of war. So I have the customer side, the, the industry, saying that they want all of these things. And so then I can kind of extrapolate that, see strategically what's happening in the, in the work, in the marketplace. And then I can then turn to the other side at Cisco and I can help prepare Cisco for these incoming market access requirements. So it's improving the global landscape. Uh, like for example, currently I'm working on a secure data deletion standard that will influence the entirety of Europe. So I'm working on one side to influence the global cybersecurity standards of the world, but then I'm also taking those lessons learned and I'm throwing them back into Cisco's, you know, secure development lifecycle, our product lines and making them more secure. So it's, it's kind of a fun job. But if you want to keep going to the next slide, I kind of broke it up for you because market access is kind of complicated if you've never heard of it before. And even when I was in, you know, my, my major in college, we never talked about market access. We maybe like glossed over it in one of my intro classes. But this is a, a huge part of cybersecurity that's not really talked about. And so the more popular ones are like the global standards. And so those are the ones that are common across the industry. So that's just like security best practices for like routers and switches and those guys. Then there's market specific market access requirements. So you have uh, standards for healthcare or standards for a specific country. So it's very specified. And then you have internal kind of requirements if different to your, to, your, to your company. So like I was saying, I take those global standards and those market specific standards, I influence them, and then I take those lessons learned and things that we, we do there, and then I turn them inwards to our internal policies and I try to you know, beef up the cybersecurity posture of Cisco. So it sounds pretty fun. <laughs> uh, if you wanna keep going to the next slide, this is kind of a, cause I like pictures, right? 
this is kind of a life cycle of what a market access requirement would look like. And so we can make up a customer, for example, customer A, you know, is in a heavily regulated industry service provider. That's a big one now, especially with 5G coming down the line. And they might have a list of requirements in order to enter this market. So in order for you, Cisco, or you, IBM, or whoever, to sell to me, you have to meet these requirements. Sometimes they're similar to industry standards. Sometimes they're brand new. It really depends. So that request kind of is put into place within the industry. But ideally, Cisco and other cu customers have time to influence and to kind of provide feedback for those standards well before it becomes like a law. Then, you know, turning into Cisco, we got to prioritize and we have to align. We have to figure out, you know, what, what are the gaps? How, how have we not met this yet? What does Cisco need to do in order to, you know, make this move forward? Then we actually have to make those changes and integrate them into the product lines, whether that be cloud or on-prem, whether it be like a cryptographic module. There's a myriad of different things that market access covers. So it covers cloud, it covers IoT, it covers on-prem, which is like routers, switches, like pizza box devices. It, it uh, applies to cryptographic modules, which go inside of devices. So pretty much every part of the threat surface area that you can find, like there's a market access requirement or industry standard that tries its best to make sure that the security best practices are met. And then there's verification, right? So always trust, but always verify. And so we always make sure that everything that we've done up until now has actually gone into plan. And then approval, which is a a short victory, but it's always ongoing maintenance. So it's like, yay, okay, now back to work. Because it's not just a static point in time thing. We have to continuously be developing and improving. And we have to make sure that all the standards and all of the you know, market access requirements that we just embedded into our products stay up to date and current. So if we wanna kind of move forward, this is you know global access from a worldview. And then I'm gonna break it apart into country specific. So like common criteria, for example, there are many components within common criteria, but that, you know, ironically, right, common, it's the most common of the market access requirements that you'll probably hear. Um, it has network device uh, protection profiles, which are essentially just right that list of security best practices that need to be implemented. There's for wireless devices. So common criteria really covers the, the spectrum of, of product lines. Then we kind of have an ISO 27001. ISO is a very popular certification body. And essentially what that is, it's more corporate focused, more risk management focused. So you can have market access requirements that focus on products and you know cloud or whatever, but you can also have certifications that basically come up to a customer and a customer comes up to Cisco and says, hey, how do I know I can trust you? And one of the many components that go into how can I trust you is uh, accommodating and applying to market access requirements. So Cisco is saying with an ISO 27001 or with whatever common criteria is like, hey, we take security seriously. Here's our proof, step one. So right, it's not the only answer, but it's definitely a component in the, the equation. So if we wanna move to, to Europe, Europe's my favorite for market access. I think they're really doing great things over there. They're always on the bleeding edge of what's going on. They were one of the first areas of the world to pop up when cloud became a huge thing because there was a, an issue a while ago where cloud technology was exponentially being sold and governments wanted to utilize it. But we, you have to think about security if you're trying to protect your citizens' data. And so they were like, okay, well, we want to go to cloud. It's cheaper, it's scalable, there's all great things, but there's no certification, there's no industry standard to accommodate. Like, how do I know if this cloud product is secure? And so Germany, uh, with their C5 certification, is, is awesome. It's a cloud-based certification. It's very lightweight, and it pretty much you have to get a C5 in order to sell into the German public sector, which is the government. And then a lot of German commercial customers are also starting to ask for this. France is doing the same in Secnum Cloud, so that's like the French version of uh, cloud certification. And uh, GDPR, I think, is probably the one that you might have heard the most because it was in, got a lot of news time. And that's just the general data protection regulation. And another reason that I really like Europe is they were one of the, actually like the first to say like, hey, we're gonna take our citizens' data seriously and we're gonna back that up with legal regulation. And so it gives you know, users the right to own their own data, the right to delete their own data. It really gives autonomy back to the citizen where we're kind of in a world right now where you know, your browsing history can be sold, like all of these things where you don't feel like you're in control of, of your data and your presence online. And GDPR kind of tries to reel that back in and it kind of shows that you know, we're not going to let big corporations dictate how our data is being handled. We're going to kind of try to take control back. So if we want to kind of lastly move to Asia Pacific. 
Oh, or North America first. It's fine. Uh, North America, big fan. Uh, I, I would say like the the two kind of that pop up to me the most is FedRAMP. That's that's one of the most popular. It's a cloud certification for to sell into the the United States government. A lot of countries look to the FedRAMP standard in order to model their own country specific standards. Um, NIST 800-53. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They partner. They were they're heavily in the U.S., but again, they are a globally recognized uh, department. Where like in Asia, in Asia Pacific, in Europe, uh, South America, countries look to NIST to for their standards and to model after their own or even just adapt them. Okay. And then HIPAA. H HIPAA um, is for the healthcare industry. So we're going to move lastly to. APJ. Um, APJ is re relatively newer in the market access area. I would say they're starting to take it really seriously. There's two that I can kind of I like that are coming up and one is in Singapore. It's the, the MTCS certification and that's cloud specific. Um, and then the Australian government has the CCSL, the uh, cloud certified security list. Um, that one has just kind of started and is ramping up and it's the only way that you can consume cloud products if you're a government in Australia. And so lastly, just kind of to wrap up, kind of wanted to start with, um, you know, how I got here, which I, I actually enjoy this because I had to sit down and reflect how I got here. And I was like, well, that was, this took an interesting couple of turns that I did not foresee when I was first, you know, majoring in accounting and pre-law. Did not think I would be here today talking to you about this. Um, and kind of the, a little bit of the challenges I faced um, I think one of the biggest ones, especially if you're a, a female in the tech field, is it can get a little lonely sometimes. And I don't think people talk about that a lot because you are kind of ostracized a little bit. Um, but it's really important to keep that social network. So when I was in college, I joined the Resident Advisors Association and I was an RA on campus. And I also just took a couple extra classes in American Sign Language because I love sign language. And so I made friends that way and I built my social network outside of kind of the, the computing school, which could have be a little intimidating to me and people weren't as approachable <laughs> as if compared to like more other schools like liberal arts and, and stuff like that. But if I kind of wanted to take the things that I wish I could tell myself now, back then, I, I would kind of start with just every internship that you do, every job that you have, just treat that as a really long interview. <laughs> it's almost better if you just interview and not intern because then you have like a two hour or a one hour interview instead of a six month interview but you should go to work every day when you're an intern as if you are being interviewed so when i was at cisco i started with a lot of different people and some of those people are working at cisco and others were not invited back and so just because you get the internship does not mean that you're entitled to get a full-time job and so I would go in every day. I would, we would make it a competition because you would take cases and run connections and we would see who, who could take as many cases as they could in a day. And so I was always challenging myself. I was always pushing myself forward, which has helped me because when I wanted to come back to Cisco, it took one email and my old manager said, absolutely, uh, come on down. And I didn't realize until later that other people that were in my same internship program wanted to come back, but their work kind of spoke for themselves. and. When, you, when you're Cisco, you can afford to be picky with your employees, and so they just decided not to invite certain people back. So along kind of the same note, now that I have a full-time job, uh, everything that you do, kind of treat yourself, uh, and every project that you do, you kind of treat it like there's an invisible little signature with your name on it. Because your projects, the initiatives you work on, really any meeting you attend, that's, that's how it's shaping your, your reputation and your work character. And those projects and, and those initiatives will still be around even when you've moved to other teams. So I still have people from TAC emailing me and saying, you know, oh, I saw your training on this, this, and this. It was really great. Thank you for doing that. So just because you leave a job does not mean that yeah, that's where your reputation and your character in the workplace stops. It doesn't. And so just always being conscious and purposeful in your intent and what you're doing and just just doing everything to the fullest because you shouldn't leave anything on the table wishing that it was different because that's you on the table. That's You should put your, yourself into that. Um, and then thirdly, which is really important, because I've had some good jobs and some not, and they can almost always be drawn back to, to management. So when you're interviewing for a job, interview the management, the, the leadership team. So if your, your manager is the one interviewing you, don't feel scared that you can't ask them questions. You absolutely should, because you're looking to see if they're as much of a fit for you as you are for them. 
Look for a manager that wants to invest his or her time and effort and resources into you. Managers are supposed to you know, clear the obstacles for you. They're supposed to help you grow your skills. They're supposed to be enablers for you. But sometimes managers are a little bit more focused on other priorities and other activities, and they might not give you the attention that you especially need early in your career. So it's very important to look for managers that want to help you grow and succeed. And then kind of fourthly, never stop asking questions. One weird thing that I learned when I kind of joined the tech world was this, this like engineering pride where asking questions that you might think other people already know is, is stupid. Like you don't, you don't want to do that because you're afraid that your peers are going to judge you for something that you should already know. I never understood that. I still see it and I just think it's silly. Like just ask the question because I guarantee you someone else has the same question, but they're just afraid to ask. And so just don't let that kind of inhibit you because it's really the best way to learn. It's the best way to build connections and relationships. And really lastly, just get comfortable with failing. It sounds terrible, but it's true because it's a part of life. And if you're not failing, you're in the wrong area. If you're not you know, constantly pushing yourself, if you're not constantly slightly afraid that you might not succeed, then you're not doing it right. Because failing is a part of life. And if you learn from it, it's not really failure. So, uh, you know, get comfortable failing and get back up. It's not about how you kind of give up. It's about how you move on. So, yeah, that's all I had. Thank you, Samantha, so much. That was such an amazing story. And uh, we actually had a comment come in while you were talking, and I'm just going to share it quickly before we go to Rihanna. <laughs> it said, for Samantha, thank you for sharing your story. I relate to your imposter syndrome <laughs> and not having female role models. But this is the key, Samantha. You have inspired me to stay on my IT track. So good for you, Samantha. Do it. <laughs> and I love, I love the fact that you started in one field and then ended up in another, because I think that's really? so true for so many people. So I really uh, love the fact that you shared that. So thanks for your insight, uh, mm -hmm. Samantha, and your passion and just your exuberance. And now we're going to turn it over to Rihanna Lynn, who's the CEO and founder of Journey Foods. So Rihanna, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. I, I wanted to start by saying uh, thank you to the Cisco team for having me. Uh, Samantha, great pointers there. It was great to learn more about your journey uh, at Cisco and your career as a, and developing into a cybersecurity leader. I think there are great takeaways there that I, I don't have to repeat now, especially when it comes to the imposter syndrome or sort of just working through failure. Uh, so I'm very happy that you mentioned that. But uh, for me today, I wanted to talk about uh, the side of startups and entrepreneurship and, and why and how you can be and build anything. And I think um, for what I wanted to do was bring my story here to Cisco and talk about how as a, a young girl, I really started to build the passion and that fires me through uh, the, the barriers and the milestones and the excitement that comes with building a, a technology company. Uh, and, and, and then let's start on, on the next slide. So a little background, I, I share this photo because I grew up uh, in Evanston, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. My family migrated uh, from the South, uh, from Alabama in the 60s. Uh, and, and I remember spending my summers driving back down to Alabama to visit my uh, pet peacock that my great grandfather bought for me. And um, early as, as a young girl, I was very removed from sort of understanding why and how and what the what my family would around me would bring to uh, later parts of my life. I was really more excited by the fact that they just they moved to a great city of Chicago that I was able to have access to uh, a, a diverse upbringing. Uh, and it's it's now today that I look back and I'm very very proud of the opportunities to to go back and sort of revisit. Uh, a simple, more rural agricultural life. Uh, and uh, if you go into the next slide, as I mentioned, uh, very early in my career, I, I actually was supported by a single mother who made sure that I went to uh, a great school that had technology programs, that I went to after school programs that uh, helped me access science and technology uh, classes and also made sure that I was able to enrich myself at home by uh, finding ways to bring a computer to, to the household. And I would say um, that 
in recognition of Black History Month, I want to make sure that we talk very clearly about uh, some of the data when it comes to uh, single parent households, especially in the 90s, uh, uh, African American households in the 90s where uh, computers weren't very, very accessible. And I was able to even uh, find ways to throw myself into computers and the life of uh, gaming very early. And uh, from there realized that I have been a builder my entire life. Um, but what I wanted to do when I was probably about seven years old was find ways to research uh, chronic disease and health. I told, I told my mother as a young girl that I wanted to grow up and become a scientist and a researcher and, and, and solve big problems around health. Uh, and, and we can talk about what that means today in my current career. Uh, but that led me into uh, going to college at University of North Carolina, Samantha. I, I, I went to school and lived five years in the research triangle, uh, then did some research at Duke. But when I was an undergrad, I studied biology and chemistry. At the time, 2004, I think Facebook had just come out. I was learning how to build the YouTube prototypes uh, in my dorm room. There were about three uh, there were three women or three uh, classmates in computer science at the time. There were 20 uh, classmates total. So there were just 23 in a class of 16,000 uh, computer science majors. So when I was at, in school between 2004 and 2008 uh, in undergrad, we knew nothing about going into a career of technology other than the fact that uh, Mark Zuckerberg was building uh, Facebook, and uh, there were engineers that sort of sat in their basements, as we've mentioned earlier, that built and hacked things. But the careers within technology that were really starting to take off in the late 2000s into 2010s uh, were not really told to us in college. We were told that we can become scientists, uh, business businessmen and women, and, and lawyers or, or doctors. Uh, so it was it was really by my experience and by my interest that I became sort of a dorm room uh, computer scientist and, and was very interested in building things that brought me uh, joy and brought me brought me earnings and what I started was around e-commerce. Uh, so uh, as I look to establish my career and find ways to become a leader and a young leader in health and, and impact. If you go to the next slide, uh, I was given the opportunity to to work at the White House. And this is actually a picture of me uh, working at the First Lady's Garden. I used to get up every morning around 6.30 a.m. And, and work in the First Lady's Garden, which fed a lot of the staffers and the family uh, between 2010, uh, when I think the, the garden launched through, through 2016. Uh, and that was a proud moment for me because when I look back, the two things outside of my role at the White House that I was most interested in was finding ways to sit with the engineers that were building the White House website because I thought that was a great way to access the people around the country and help help many understand what we were building. And also the First Lady's Garden um, because I grew up helping my grandmother who had migrated from Alabama find ways to still grow carrots and beets and peppers and other types of vegetables in a small backyard uh, just outside of Chicago. So it felt very at home for me uh, to find ways to bring politics and policy into this career journey that I was leading into. Uh, at the same time, I was even able to, on the next slide, uh, uh, next slide please, uh, get a Guinness Book of uh, World Records and, and share in that moment. You may find me in there and sort of sort of a where's Waldo if you can. Um, I should have added a little circle there. Just um, I'm just to the corner of the the first lady's uh, uh, right elbow. Uh, but I, that was a time when I had to save her from 500 fifth graders. <laughs> but uh, what I realized at the White House, uh, to be honest, is that entrepreneurs and CEOs still helped influence a lot of decisions. 
Uh, and I was able to finally meet tech entrepreneurs that were building amazing companies and solving problems that they found in college or in their first jobs, uh, when it, around healthcare or around uh, delivery services, even some mobile apps that are not are, that are not existent today. But they were going out there and building things and creating their own lifestyles around things that they wanted to solve. And so uh, when I left the White House, I decided that it had been a passion of mine to continue family tradition and food and launch a, uh, a chain of juice bars. Next slide, please. Uh, so in 2011, I actually launched a juice bar with a focus on bringing e-commerce uh, to the Chicagoland area. And the reason why I focused on this was because I wanted to make sure that I could continue to learn how to build uh, and make money when I was sleeping. And so the goal of that was to, one, learn how to build websites at the next level, to find ways to build a company that would support my family, support my dreams, and support my interests in bringing healthier, fresher food to a gamut of uh, folks around Chicago and, and beyond that. And one thing that I realized was brick and mortar is great, but it's not necessarily the future of all business endeavors or uh, the traditions that um, many small business owners have kept uh, when it comes to launching a store or a restaurant or a, any, any type of brick and mortar uh, business, uh, there are limitations to scaling and growth. And I really wanted to find ways to get my products uh, around the country, uh, around North America and beyond. Uh, and as that started to take off and we, re we reached a lot of growth, I realized that the people I was working with every day, the employees, the customers, had a lot of questions about where our products were coming from, about the traceability of our products. And we were running into a lot of issues understanding uh, when some of our organic products would come in and, and when we would be able to tell our customers more about um, the transparency and the supply chain of these ingredients. So I ended up finding a team of engineers that were friends. We sat down for several weeks and we launched a internal traceability uh, tool that we could train our, our, our whole team around. And as we started to scale this out in the company, and the, and the juice bar and the e-commerce was growing, I found that there were other food business owners that needed these services. And so they would come to me to ask about ways to scale their business and make more money. Uh, and I would pitch this traceability tool to them. And uh, this service was actually acquired um, by the show The Profit on CNBC. So I was able to then go and work on a national television show and scale up other food companies with some of the tools that we were building out uh, with my juice bars. And so one of the things that I realized was I could scale and meet and run business remotely. And that was really exciting to me. Uh, I soon after was a, was given uh, entrepreneurship and residency at Google, and there was no looking back. Uh, for me to be able to work in another country, in another city, uh, and inspire others, build tools for other businesses, and uh, live the lifestyle that I wanted to live and be able to pay bills um, with just building software was... Uh, entirely life-changing for me. And I'm still on that pathway, learning how to build a great software company uh, and understanding the tools to building remote teams, to solving problems that are really huge. Uh, but for me at this time, I was only 24 years old when we launched this service. And I was just a couple years out of college. I still had a lot of interesting opportunities. But there came several pitfalls in this. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we, we were able to scale our traceability services to almost 14,000 users uh, that were able to track and map 
ingredients, where they're coming from, where they're going uh, around the country. But I was still young. I didn't know how to build a business yet. I had not spent a lot of time around investors, around other product managers, around other CEOs that build tech companies. And so this is really where I say uh, you can solve a big problem that excites you, that drives you crazy at night, uh, but you're gonna continually have to put yourself around other, other leaders, other advisors, other builders, other product people, other, other uh, inspirational uh, business owners that have been through this pathway because uh, every challenge is different. But one thing that you will learn is that uh, you're gonna find ways to continue to hack and keep moving your business along. You're gonna find that there are, and when you're facing failure, that can come in a lot of different forms. This can be in finances, this can be in uh, finding customers to continue buying your product. This can be uh, mentally and physically as you build a company, especially for me being a young African-American woman building a product when uh, in the agriculture or in the tech industry where every room that I walked into looked exactly opposite of me, uh, I needed the fortitude over especially the last decade to make sure that I could keep finding ways, finding allies, finding partners to understand how to uh, not only mentor me, but also uh, build with me. And so uh, what, what this experience around this traceability tool helped me understand was that there were a limitless amount of possibilities and ways that I could build something that would solve a problem for myself. But there were also there was also many lessons that I had to learn as a young entrepreneur, as a minority entrepreneur, that would help me uh, create a sustainable track of, of change. And so uh, after uh, a few experiences and, and acquisitions, as well as the opportunity to work uh, in a venture capital side with the former CEO of McDonald's, scaling up companies like Beyond Meat, and working with uh, very large Fortune 500 companies on, 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 on big innovation projects. If you go to the next slide, one thing that I had to return to uh, was the reason why I told my mom at seven years old that I wanted to be a scientist. And that's because uh, not only disproportionately in, in communities of color, but in every community around the world, we are facing a uh, $3 trillion uh, food nutrition and production problem. And what does that mean? We create $3 trillion worth of uh, packaged foods every year. Processed packaged foods lead uh, to deleterious effects on our health. This is uh, chronic disease, mental health, uh, sustainable uh, environmental impact by uh, creating packaged foods. And um, these are things that affect me every day affect my family and affect every single person that uh, is tuning in right now. And so it was it, it did not sit easy on me to not continue and solve a problem around um, understanding why I went into science in the first place. And what really excites me about what we're building at Journey Foods is that we're right at the nexus of software and uh, uh, food science where we have a team of food scientists and a team of data engineers that are working every day to find ways to bring better data and better software to some of our biggest companies uh, in the world. Uh, and so we have worked with some of the most popular food brands, uh, everything from uh, the sugar that you see on your tables to uh, nutrition bars and drinks that you see in every single grocery store. And um, one thing that we found is that there's still a very big gap of technology and data services for uh, the 8 billion people that we're going to have to feed if you go to the next slide. Uh, today, there are about 38,000 people for every, one, for every one food scientist and food technologist that exists. Uh, and I think that number, uh, while it can change, uh, will we'll not necessarily have any impact if we don't turn uh, human limitations into to data and, and IT tools that can help our, our companies feed 
all 8 billion of us soon. And so at Journey Foods, we continue on the next slide to build, uh, to build technology and alerts and monitoring systems that help companies make better decisions every single day. And uh, finally, just in, in closing, as I, I'm really excited to continue the work that we do at Journey Foods and continue to continue my work as uh, as a, a technology slash science scientific uh, a leader. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to leave with uh, a, a, a few key things. Um, one, always work on things that bring you joy. Um, I would definitely have not made it over the past decade in food and food innovation and food technology if I didn't understand and find joy in waking up every day, uh, solving a problem that excites me, that challenges me, uh, but also invigorates me because I know that I can make just one or two people uh, uh, and make their, their experience and their consumption a little bit better. Uh, solve hard problems. You know, in the past decade, we started uh, entrepreneurship and technology, sort of creating apps that uh, made people smile or um, helped people with dating. And those have all been good for the consumer experience. Um, but we're facing a lot of bigger problems when it comes to our environment, when it comes to our health, when it comes to our mental health, when it comes to uh, poverty and, and so many things that we're facing that we can solve with technology and with collaboration. Uh, and so I believe the next decade, and especially even the next few years of uh, entrepreneurship and startups and bringing technology into uh, building anything you want is going to be around solving, solving hard problems that uh, some of our uh, leaders in, in policy and business are, are looking for. And, and so that means there's tremendous opportunities for young women to go out and find a problem that they're really passionate about that can bring them joy waking up every day, but it's also very challenging, which I think can bring a, a great amount of support of um, services, of grants, uh, and of partnerships. And just lastly, keep at it. Um, today, there are more than enough tools, uh, low code options, uh, um, internet accessibility, uh, groups, uh, great, uh, great sessions like these that, that Cisco's running that can help bring uh, more information and knowledge transfer to uh, anything that you want to build or anyone that you want to be. So uh, I, I would just like to say, well, you may face a lot of barriers uh, as you're building as you're trying to scale up your career, as you're trying to become a leader, either internally or with your own business. Uh, and with every challenge that you face, I promise you, if you continue to find ways to keep at it, keep yourself healthy and keep your partnerships up, that you can solve uh, anything and, and you can go out and build uh, the company of your dreams. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Well, thank you both, uh, Samantha and Rihanna. Wow, I don't I actually don't know where to start. Um, I saw so many commonalities between the two of you in terms of sticking with it, doing what brings you passion. You may have started in one field, but you may end up in another field. And so uh, there are so many commonalities between the two of you, but you're on very different paths. And the other thing that I heard um, from both of you is that you may have been a minority from a from a, a gender or from a race, but you just you sort of acknowledge that and you just push through it, right? And and I think that's what we as as young women have to do is you just have to, as my mother used to say, put on your big girl pants and just kind of push your way through it, right? And so you are two amazing examples of that. We have time for a couple of questions, and I have one for Samantha, and then Rihanna, I'm going to have one for you right after Samantha. So, um, Samantha, this one is for you. The question is around certifications. What are your thoughts on cybersecurity certifications? Since experience is so valuable, what type of certification do you think is preferred in the security field? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I can tell you that certifications are an excellent way to showcase your commitment to security and your knowledge base in security, but don't use those as a crutch. Um, 
just talking from someone who used to work in the Technical Assistance Center, I have worked with so many CCIEs that I would not have known they were CCIEs unless they told me. So just because someone has a certification, don't let that be your, your sole kind of purpose for how intelligent you are. But I think they're very important, especially when you're like, job hunting, because they use certifications, HR rather, to filter uh, contestants, kind of, to filter uh, people that are trying to apply um, just because just based on how serious you take it. So I guess to ask, to answer your question, which certifications, I'm actually currently studying for my CISSP. I think that's a really great foundational, uh, wide range certification to, to take in the industry. Um, Cisco Security, they have two types of certifications, uh, I believe, if it hasn't changed, I hope I'm right. Uh, one, it has to do with operations, and then the other one is security from like a, a networking or like a device standpoint. Uh, those are, are awesome. I've seen um, and I've kind of helped to contribute to some of the, the stuff on those, those certifications, so they're great. Uh, you really can't go wrong, honestly, with, with CISP and then a couple of pairing, a nice pairing of a couple of Cisco certs, you'll be on your way. I think that's a good, a good foundation. <laughs> like one inch. No, thank you, Samantha. That's a good answer. And I think there is value in certifications. And I think your point is it demonstrates your commitment to the field. And that's what many hiring managers are looking for is that passion and that commitment. So Rihanna, I have a question for you. You've got such a wide range of experience from working with Michelle Obama in the White House garden, which has to have been so much fun, um, to uh, supply chain and e-commerce and writing software and Google entrepreneurship. I mean, you've got such a wide range. The question that came in is, what inspires you most in your career? Given the breadth of what you do, what's the thing that really pierces your heart and gets you up every day? No, totally. I, I would reiterate that um, for me, solving the problems around food. Um, you know, I grew up sort of gardening and farming with my family. Every company that I've built has been a food company. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the most important uh, industry, some the most important industry in the world, I believe, is agriculture. Uh, and these are things that we need every single day. It affects every single person on this planet, just, of course, like water and, and energy. But uh, I'm going to continue to work in food for the rest of my career. Um, and, and you can hold me to that. Uh, and I will continue to find ways to make sure that like I'm healthier, my family's healthier, and, and everyone that I meet is impacted by products that, that my company builds. That's a, that's, a, that's a great reply. And, and the thing I love about your field, Rihanna, is that many people probably don't think of IT and food going together, right? Maybe they think of a vending machine and that's about as far as it goes, but people may not think of the intersection of true IT and software applications when it comes to their food. And so I think this was a great example to open people's eyes to how IT touches every part of our life today, fields that we may not think of. Clearly with Samantha in IT, everybody kind of knows like, okay, security, and they hear about phishing, but food and IT and security probably weren't something that, that was in most of, of the people's minds. This is a question for both of you, and I'll go back to Samantha, and then I think we'll end with Rihanna here. How much is creativity valued in your field? I think this might be a bit harder for you, Samantha, than for you, Rihanna, because I see a lot of creativity in yours. But Samantha, oh, yeah. how much is creativity you know, favored or needed in the field of cyber? It is so important because creativity is not just about, you know, like drawing stuff. Like when I was younger, I, I was a terrible artist. The last thing I made was like the turkey handprints, like in third grade, art. like I can't do art. So I always thought I wasn't creative. Absolutely not. Creativity is just how you look at problems. And in cybersecurity, you want to think about it, you're protecting a house. How many creative ways can you break into that house so that way you know how to fix it? If you're not coming at it from a creative mindset and you're just coming at it from, well, I read in this textbook, it said A, B, and C, so I'll just do that, you're going to lose every time. So creativity is so important. Seeing things from other perspectives and kind of just diving into open-mindedness and having a really diverse and creative team, it, it just step outside of what the standard definition of creativity is, and creativity is I would argue one of the top three attributes to have as a cybersecurity engineer, for sure. 
Phenomenal answer. I don't think people would have thought of that. that. So thank you, Samantha. So Rihanna, creativity in your field, how important is it? I mean, it's absolutely important. There's a lot of traditional uh, barriers that exist when it comes to how we get our food, who runs our food systems. Uh, and you see that every single day, especially recently with companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat and you know, companies uh, like, like Journey Foods. Uh, we have to be creative in order to break traditional models. Uh, and as you said, Samantha, solving, finding different ways to solve problems. Um, but also we have to find ways to make uh, food problems and food technology and other large problems, even cybersecurity sexy, right? And you have to be creative with that because you want to, you want to continue to recruit great minds, diverse minds, young minds and future talent. Uh, and so creativity is great when you create in uh, sustainable recruiting models and also solving problems. Great answer. So I love you both. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate both of you dedicating an hour to spend with us. And I hope that all the students and teachers that are out there that the between Samantha and Rihanna, they, they opened your eyes. They gave you some new topics to talk about in your classroom. They gave you some new ideas about the application of technology. Um, the presentations and the recording will be made available today online. So if you're looking at your screen now, you'll see a QR code. We would love for you all to dig a bit deeper into some of the Network Academy courses that we're offering for you. We have Intro to Cybersecurity to kind of scratch uh, Samantha's itch there and, and kind of see what her world is like. And then we have Entrepreneurship, which is right up Rihanna's line in terms of you know, do you see yourself running your own company in the future, right? And so we really would encourage any of you out there to, to take it, you know, take a chance and enroll in some of those self-paced courses, see what you can, how you can see yourself in the future. So thank you all very much for attending today. We will have more Women Rock IT because at Cisco with Chuck Robbins as our CEO, we are really committed to accelerating the rate of women engineers women in leadership positions and really showcasing and growing the percentage of women in the field of IT, cybersecurity and entrepreneurship. So thank you everyone. Thanks again to our two speakers for giving us your time and your expertise. I wish you all a good rest of the day and I hope to see you again on the next Women Rock IT. Take care everyone, bye. Thank you.